uh good evening all and welcome to the 14th edition of cghs webinars for doctors uh today we will be discussing a very important topic that is hypertension as we all know it is one of the leading cause of global burden of disease and it is estimated that that more than a billion people suffer from this condition and its related complications today we have with us today we have with us dr alpana chuk specialist from the department of medicine RML Hospital, New Delhi, to talk about all we need to know about hypertension as a family physician. Before we begin, I would like to inform you all to put all your queries which you have regarding the topic at hand in the chat box so that we can discuss these queries at the end. Over to you, ma'am. Please start. Thank you, Dr. Anandu, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm Dr. Alpana Chuk. And for the next 50 55 minutes, we will be talking about an important topic hypertension. And you all must be aware of it. And for the last few years, the uh, guidelines have kept the levels of BP at the same level like when we call it as hypertension. So, in the 2013, then 2018, and even in the latest 2023 ESH guidelines. Hypertension is still defined as office SVP values, that is systolic blood pressure values more than or equal to 140 and or diastolic blood pressure values more than or equal to 90. Now, one of the key risk factors for cardiovascular disease is hypertension or raised blood pressure. Hypertension already affects 1.1 billion people worldwide uh, as per 2015 WHA survey leading to heart attacks and strokes and by 2025 it is estimated that over 1.5 billion people will have hypertension and the researchers have asked, estimated that raised blood pressure currently kills 9 million people every year so it is very important to control hypertension now as per the classification we have categorized into optimal normal high normal or grade one, two, two, uh, one, two, and three for hypertension. Now, this is the table which is showing, showing that the optimal BP for anyone is less than 120 systolic and less than 80 diastolic. Normal is between 120 to 130, 129, and 80 to 84. High normal we call when it is between 130 to 139 systolic and diastolic 85 to 89. And a patient is labeled to have grade 1 hypertension when the systolic blood pressure is between 140 to 159 and diastolic is 90 to 99. Grade 2 hypertension is labeled when 160 to 179 is the systolic blood pressure and diastolic when 100 to 109. And grade 3 hypertension when BP is more than or equal to 180 and diastolic is more than or equal to 110. There is another terminology which we call as isolated systolic hypertension. Now, isolated systolic hypertension is when we have systolic BP more than or equal to 140, but the diastolic is less than 90. And there's another term, isolated diastolic hypertension, when the systolic blood pressure is less than 140, but the diastolic is more than or equal to 90. Now, first of all, before telling how to manage hypertension, we should know how to measure accurately the blood pressure. Now, there are two methods. One is when a patient comes to your clinic or office, there is office BP measurement. And other is out of office BP measurement, which can be done by two ways, either home blood pressure monitoring or by ABPN, which is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Now, Whenever a patient comes to your clinic, the patient should be seated comfortably in a quiet environment for five minutes before BP measurement is begun. Three BP measurements should be recorded one to two minutes apart. And if there is difference of more than 10 millimeter between the first two readings, then additional two BP readings may be taken. And BP is recorded as the average of the last two BP readings. In some patients who have arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. Additional measurements will have to be done in whom manual method, manual oscillatory method is better as compared to the automated devices. 
we should always use a standard bladder here, which has a measurement of 12 to 13 centimeter wide and 35 centimeter long. But a larger cuff and a smaller cuff should be available so that we have the accurate measurements in very thin and obese people. The cuff should be positioned at the level of the heart with the arm and back supported to avoid muscle contraction and isometric exercise dependent increases in blood pressure. Now, when using the auscultatory method, we use phase one and five Korthakov sounds to identify the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure respectively. Whenever a patient comes to you for the first time, always measure blood pressure in both the arms at the first time. Use the arm with the higher value as the reference. Now, when the patient comes to you for the first time, measure BP one minute and three minutes after standing from a seated position. This is to exclude orthostatic hypotension. The lying and standing BP measurement should also be considered in subsequent visits in people who have diabetes, in older people or patients having autonomic failure conditions so that we don't miss orthostatic hypertension. Also, record the heart rate and use pulse palpation to exclude arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation. So, to revise the precautions we have to see while measuring BP, a quiet room with comfortable temperature, no smoking, caffeine, food or drug intake or exercise 30 minutes before the measurement. Remain seated and relax for three to five minutes. No talking during or between the measurements. Patient should be sitting with back supported by chair. Legs should be uncrossed, feet flat on the floor. Bare arm resting on table, mid arm at heart level. The cuff should fit arm size and we should use validated automated electronic upper arm cuff device. Now at first office BP, I have already discussed that it should be done in both the arms. Now, suppose we have a difference of more than 15 to 20 in both the arms. This suggests that this patient is having arthritis disease and has high cardiovascular risk. Also, it is recommended to diagnose hypertension during at least two separate office visits within four weeks unless office BP indicates grade 3 hypertension that is more than 18010. So, if a patient comes to you and he has grade 1 hypertension, then call him within 4 weeks to your clinic again. Unless a patient has grade 3 hypertension, 180 by 110, or if the patient has any of the hypertension-related symptoms, or there is evidence of HMOD. HMOD is hypertension-mediated organ damage or cardiovascular disease. Then this patient is labeled as hypertension in that visit only. So, when we are taking the readings, for the office sitting, take three readings with one minute interval between the readings and use average of the last two. But when you're taking readings at the home, take two readings with one minute interval between the two and use the average. Now, we have two terms, white coat hypertension and masked hypertension. What is white coat hypertension? This is inappropriately high office BP. And this leads to overdiagnosis. And what is mass hypertension? This is inappropriately normal office BP, and this leads to underdiagnosis. Now, the criteria for labeling the patient as having hypertension when a patient comes to office or your clinic, we label him as having hypertension if systolic is more than or equal to 140 and diastolic more than or equal to 90. But the uh, levels are different when we are dealing with ambulatory BP. Ambulatory BP, the daytime or awake mean BP, if it's more than or equal to 135 and diastolic more than or equal to 85. And the nighttime or asleep BP, if it's more than or equal to 120 and diastolic more than or equal to 70, we label as hypertension. And the 24 hour mean BP is more than or equal to 130 and diastolic more than or equal to 80. And in the home measurement, if the BP is more than, systolic is more than or equal to 135 and diastolic more than or equal to 85, we call it as hypertension. So the criteria are slightly, the levels for labeling as hypertension are different for office, ambulatory and home mean BP. Now if we compare like both ABPM and HBPM, like home BP monitoring, they have some disadvantages and advantages. 
ABPM it can identify both can identify white coat and mass hypertension as compared to office BP measurement. ABPM that has a stronger prognostic evidence. Nighttime readings, which is a very important criteria, or patients who have who don't have a normally all patients, everyone has a dip in his BP at night time. But if there is no dip in BP, the BP rises during the night. That is a severe bad prognostic factor for having stroke or cardiovascular incidence. So nighttime readings can be done by ABPM. Additional prognostic BP phenotypes. So from ABPM, we can have abundant information from a single measurement, including short-term BP variability. Like how is the BP variability when patient is doing exercise or during some stress? So ABPM can tell us all of these. But the disadvantage of ABPM is it's expensive and there is a limited um, availability. Moreover, it can be uncomfortable for some. Or HBPM, it can also identify white coat hypertension and uh, mast hypertension. It is cheap and it's widely available. Measurement is done in a home setting, which may be more relaxed than a doctor's office. Patient engagement in BP measurement, it can be easily repeated and used over longer periods and day to day variability can be assessed. Now, disadvantages only static BP is available, not like ABPM. Potential for measurement error and no nocturnal readings are possible in HBPM as compared to ABPM. So, when do we ask for a patient for HBPM or ABPM? Any of like patient has come to your clinic and now you'll tell him that okay, come to me after four weeks with these either ABPM, you put a ABPM to the patient or you ask for HBPM. So, if the patient has conditions in which white coat hypertension is more common, like if a patient has one, grade 1 hypertension on office BP measurement or marked office BP elevation without any evidence of HMOD, which is hypertension mediated organ damage. So, condition in which mass hypertension is more common, if a patient comes to you and he has high normal office BP, and normal office BP in individuals with HMOD at or at high total cardiovascular risk. Also, patients who have some patients have postural or postprandial hypertension. They can be advised ABPM or HBPM. For patients whom we have resistant hypertension, we can ask them to get a charting of the readings at home. Evaluation of BP control, especially in treated higher risk groups exaggerated BP response to exercise. In all these patients, we can ask, in addition to office reading, which we already have, a HBPM monitoring or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. When there is considerable variability in the office BP, suppose the, the readings in the office are very variable, you can ask for a HBPM monitoring. Evaluating symptoms consistent with hypotension during treatment. If, if some patients complain of hypotension during treatment, so they also can bring the home blood pressure monitoring or ABPM monitoring. Now, there are some very specific indications where we do advise such patients to go for ABPM. That is assessment of nocturnal BP values and the dipping status. Example, if you're suspecting nocturnal hypertension, such as in patients having obstructive sleep apnea, CKD patients, diabetics, endocrine hypertension or autonomic dysfunction. Now, what are the devices we have to measure BP? The most commonly we have automatic, electronic, upper arm devices. They are recommended for office and out of office BP measurements also. Hybrid manual auscultatory devices with LCD or LED display or digital countdown or shock resistant aneroid device can be used for office BP measuring. But these are done if automatic devices are not available. Only properly validated devices should be used. Cuffless BP devices like the wristband or that should not be used for evaluation or management of hypertension in clinical practice. So once we have a patient, you have the patient and he comes to your clinic and the diagnosis, you have measured the BP. Now, if the BP is less than 120, and diastolic is less than 80, he has an optimal BP. Now, what do you advise? You advise repeat BP at least, at least every five days. 
If a patient has normal BP like between 120 to 129 and diastolic between 80 to 84, ask him to repeat BP at least every three years. And the category where we have, this is the mass hypertension. Like if a high normal BP is like 130 to 139 and diastolic is 85 to 89, this is masked hypertension. The hypertension is masked here. So at least repeat the BP annually. And these are the patients whom you'll advise that you should have visit four weeks again after within four weeks with a HBPM or you can ask for a ABPM. Now, once patient has a hypertension more than 140, 90, so what we can do, use either to confirm, either repeated visits for office BP measurement or we can ask for a out of office BP measurements and next, when to start treatment, we'll let you know. Now, some patients, they have, they have been diagnosed with hypertension, but not all patients will have equal cardiovascular risk, right? There will be some patients who will be at more cardio, uh, cardiovascular risk. Now, who are these patients? Men normally have more chances of cardiovascular disease. Patients who have more age, smoking either currently or there's a past history of smoking. Total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol levels. Serum uric acid levels are very important. Diabetics, patient is overweight, obesity. There is a family history of premature cardiovascular disease. If there is a family history of CVD, a men less than 55, women less than 65, there is family or parental history of early onset hypertension. There is early onset menopause and female, sedentary lifestyle, psychosocial and socioeconomic factors, and heart rate. If the resting heart rate value is more than 80, all these patients will have high cardiovascular risk. In addition, in fact, patients who have chronic migraine, depressive syndromes, erectile dysfunction, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, OSA, COPD, all these patients have high risk of cardiovascular damage. Now, there's an emerging evidence that increase in the serum uric acid levels to levels lower than those typically associated with gout is independently associated with increased cardiovascular risk. That is, measurement of serum uric acid level is recommended as part of screening of the hypertensive patient. So if a patient's hypertensive patient serum uric acid levels are high, he has more chances of cardiovascular disease. Now, when a patient comes to you, he may have asymptomatic hypertensive mediated organ damage, which we can know by arterial stiffening. Like if the pulse pressure is more, it is more than 60. That means there is asymptomatic, there is damage to the vessels have been done. If the pulse wave velocity, carotid femoral pulse wave velocity difference is more than 10 meter per second, then this is HMOD. If in the ECG there is left ventricular hypertrophy, that is a strong evidence of HMOD. And if there is ST depression in the anterolateral leaks, that is left ventricular strain pattern, that is a strong indicator of HMOD. HMOD is hypertension mediated organ damage. In ECO, if we find left ventricular hypertrophy, if on urine examination, we find microalbuminuria, that is the secretion of albumin is more between 30 to 300 or elevated albumin creatinine ratio. There is moderate CKD with EGFR more than 30, but less than 60. The ABI index, ankle brachial index is less than 0.9. There are on funders if there is retinopathy, hemorrhages, all these are HMOV. Now, some patients may have, that was asymptomatic, but some patients may have established cardiovascular or renal disease. If a patient has already suffered ischemic stroke, cerebral hemorrhage, TIA, or he has myocardial infarction, angina, or history of myocardial revascularization, all these patients have HMO. Presence of atheromatous plaque on imaging. If there is heart failure, peripheral artery disease or atrial fibrillation, all these patients already have HMOD secondary to hypertension. So now a patient comes to you, you have checked his BP, you have found that his BP is high. What is the history you will take? You will take a personal history like what, is, what was the first time the patient was diagnosed with hypertension. You will see all the previous records, any hospitalization has been done earlier. Whether the BP is stable for last so many days or it is rapidly increasing. 
also records of current and past BP values, which the patient has taken by himself. We'll see all the records of the current and past medication, including their effectiveness. Adherence to therapy, whether the patient is taking the drug treatment, is compliant to it or not. Any In females, you have to take previous hypertension history in pregnancy or there's history of preeclampsia. Then you have to evaluate the patient for the risk factors. Okay, you'll ask for family history of hypertension, CVD, stroke or kidney disease, smoking history, history, dietary history, alcohol consumption, lack of physical exercise or sedentary lifestyle, any weight gain or loss in the past, history of erectile dysfunction. You'll have to take history of snoring, sleep apnea, because all these are causes of secondary hypertension. Distress with job or at home, and if the patient is a long-term cancer survivor. Now, after taking personal history and evaluating the risk factors, you'll take the history of any symptoms related to HMOD or CVD stroke. So if a patient has history of headache, vertigo, syncope, impaired vision, TIA, any sensory or motor deficit, any stroke, carotid revascularization, cognitive impairment, memory loss, and dementia, the brain has been affected and eyes have been affected. For the heart, if there is history of chest pain, shortness of breath, any edema, myocardial infarction, any history of cardiac coronary revascularization, syncope, history of palpitation, especially arrhythmias, heart failure, the heart has been affected. Kidney, if there is increased thirst, polyuria, increased nocturia, hematuria, recurrent infections, kidney has been affected. For the peripheral arteries, we'll ask for any history of cold extremities, intermittent claudication, pain-free walking distance, pain at rest. If there is any history of ulcers, necrosis, or any history of peripheral revascularization, patient or family history of CKD for to rule out polycystic kidney disease. Now, how to rule out that this patient might be having possible secondary hypertension? If the young patient comes, and when he comes to you first time and he has grade two or three hypertension, like less than 40 years and the BP is more than 180, 110, or there is sudden development of hypertension, or rapidly worsening BP in an older patient, you suspect secondary hypertension. If there is history of repetitive renal or urinary tract disease, if a patient comes with history of repeated episodes of marked sweating, headache, anxiety, palpitation, you should be alarmed that he might be having pheochromocytoma. If there is a history of spontaneous or diuretic provoked hypokalemia, there is episodes of muscle weakness and tetany. You should suspect hyperaldosteronism. If the symptoms are suggestive of thyroid disease or hyperparathyroidism, or there is history of current pregnancy or postmenopausal, in the females, take history of hypertension in pregnancy earlier, the postmenopausal status in women, and the use of oral contraceptives or any other harm. And also a history about any of the drugs the patient might be using which can cause hypertension like recreational or substance abuse drugs or non-prescription drugs like patient might be taking steroids for joint pains, any NSAIDs, COX-2 inhibitors, immunosuppressive drugs, anti-cancer drugs and nasal vasoconstrictors, nasal drops. Now next, after having a complete review of the history, we go for physical examination. Now, See the weight, height, and calculate the BMI to rule out the metabolic syndrome, waist circumference. Now, we can find some signs of hypertension mediated organ damage. In the neurological examination, we can find the cognitive status. In the funders for hypertensive retinopathy, we can auscultate the heart and carotid arteries for any brewing, palpation of carotid and peripheral arteries. We can check the ankle brachial index. In the inspection, for secondary hypertension especially, if we see the skin, we may find some evidence of uh, neurofibromatosis like kefalu patches. If we palpate the uh, abdomen and we find enlarged kidneys, we can suspect polycystic kidney disease. And in the auscultation of heart and renal arteries for any brewery, any murmur, we can think of aortic coarctation or renovascular hypertension. Any signs of Cushing disease or acromegaly or signs of thyroid disease. All these can help us and lead to the diagnosis. Now, what are the lab investigations you can send for a patient? We can send CBC, 
hematocrit, a blood glucose and HbA1c, blood lipids, blood potassium and sodium, uric acid, creatinine, and estimate the eGFR, blood calcium, urine analysis, the first voided in the morning, and dipstick in all patients, and urine albumin creatinine ratio. All these will help in finding the cause and for evaluating HMOD. Now, once we have done all the investigation, we can stratify the patient, the hypertension for, and we can assess how much is the damage due to the hypertension has already been done. Now, there is a score, which we call as systemic coronary risk evaluation. Now, by this, we can label the patient as low risk, moderate risk, high risk, and very high risk. So patients who have a score less than 1%, they have a low risk of cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years. Moderate risk patients are those who have score between 1% to 5%. These are the ones who have family history of premature CAD, abdominal obesity, physical activity pattern is less, sedentary lifestyle, HDL is low, TG is high, HRCRP. Based on these, we can label as patient. So very high risk patients are those who have any of these. If the patient is is a diagnosed case of CVD or he has type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes and target organ damage or patient with moderate to severe CKD. All these patients are very high risk patients. So why we have categorized? Like we have two things. One is the grade of the BP. Grade 1, 2, 3. And one is the stage of the BP. Stage is there is no complication. Patient is uncomplicated. Stage 2 is patient is having HMOD. CKD up to grade 3 or diabetes without organ damage. And stage 3 hypertension is patient is symptomatic CVD, he is CKD grade 4 or 5 and a diabetic patient with organ damage. This chart is showing that according to this chart, we can think whether we have to start treatment in a grade 1 patient or not. At grade 2 and 3, we have to start the treatment immediately. But in patients who have high normal and grade 1 hypertension, there we have to see the risk factors also. If the patient is very low risk, like grade 1 hypertension, patient has BP of only 140, between 140 to 160 and 90 to 99, and he is very low risk, we can keep the patient on lifestyle modification and under observation and call him after 4 weeks. So this is the importance of doing this stratification. Now, these are the tests we've already discussed that to assess whether a hypertension-mediated organ damage has been done or not. Get ECG in all patients, get a urine albumin creatinine ratio, get a blood creatinine and calculate the EGFR, check funders. All this is to be done if the patient's uh, hypertension has been confirmed. More detailed screening for this can be done by, you can do a eco and calculate the LVH carotid ultrasound for internal thickening, abdominal ultrasound to see for renal artery doppler, pulse wave velocity, ankle brachial index, cognitive function testing. All this has to be decided for individual patient. So whether to initiate blood pressure loading treatment or not. Suppose the patient comes, he has a BP of 132, 139 and 85 to 89, between 85 to 89 diastolic. He has a high normal BP. So what you'll advise? You'll advise, lifestyle advice. But if this patient is a known case of coronary vascular disease, like he already had an MI, he's a case of CAD, then in this patient, you will start the drug treatment. But in all other cases, only lifestyle advice. Similarly, in grade 1 hypertension, lifestyle advice is to be recommended for all the patients, all the rates. Immediate rate treatment is to be given in grade 1 only if there is evidence of patient is high risk or very high risk and he has established HMOD or renal disease or CVD. Otherwise, we can ask the patient for lifestyle modification and give time in low or moderate risk patients who don't have any evidence of cardiovascular disease or renal disease, 3 to 6 months of lifestyle intervention if BP is not controlled. In grade 2 hypertension, lifestyle is given and immediate drug treatment. And the aim is that we should be able to control BP in 3 months. And grade 3 also immediate. So basically, 
patients grade 2 and above have to start both lifestyle advice and start treatment immediately in grade 1 only if underlying disease is there hmod is there give treatment otherwise ask for lifestyle modification so prompt initiation of blood pressure lowering is recommended in patients grade 2 or 3 with and at any level of severest simultaneously with the initiation of lifestyle changes in patient with grade 1 lifestyle interventions are recommended if these patients have hmod if there is no hmod we can ask for lifestyle intervention in fit older patients that is who are more than 80 bp lowering drugs and lifestyle intervention are recommended when systolic blood pressure is more than 160 this will just come in the next slide so the first objective now what should be the target First objective of treatment should be to lower BP2 less than 140 90 in all patients. What should be the target? Less than 140 90. Provided treatment is well tolerated, BP should be targeted to 130 80 or lower in most. A target BP diastolic BP of 80 millimeter mercury should be considered for all hypertensive patients, independent of the level and risk of comorbidity. But the newer two 2023 guidelines stress that the target should be for systolic should be between 120 to 140 and diastolic between 70 to 80 but don't lower it below 70 for diastolic and don't lower it below 120 for systolic so here is the summary for all patients of when to start the treatment for patients between 18 to 65 all patients whether hypertensive diabetic ckd cat in CAD, we can start at 130 also. Uh, the target is to start the, uh, the threshold is to start the treatment at 140 systolic and 90 diastolic. Between 65 to 79 age, again the same criteria, 140 systolic and diastolic 90. For more than 80 years, the criteria for the, or the threshold for starting treatment is when the BP goes beyond 160. But the diastolic remains the same. Now, once we have asked the patient, okay, you have to now go for lifestyle changes. We are giving you a time period of three months. Or for anyone who is having grade two, also three, he also has to have lifestyle changes. Healthy lifestyle changes can prevent or delay the onset of hypertension and reduce cardiovascular risk. So, effective lifestyle therapies have to be done. They have to be salt restriction, reduce alcohol consumption, high concentration of vegetables and fruits should be there in diet, weight reduction, maintaining an ideal body weight and regular physical activity. Also, tobacco smoking has an acute prolonged risk effect that may raise the daytime ambulatory level. But smoking cessation has additional, in addition to lowering the blood pressure, it also has an important role in Preventing cancer and cardiovascular disease. Now, there are some uh, recent uh, guidelines which stress that increase in potassium in the diet may be done. That may help increase potassium consumption, preferably via, uh, via dietary modification is recommended in patients with elevated BP, except for patients who have CKD. Also, reduce salt intake to less than 2 grams sodium per day. DASH diet we all know. And also, the uh, alcohol should not be recommended for CBD prevention at all. Moderate consumption is also confounding, so it should not be recommended. Binge drinking should not be encouraged at all. It should be strict no. Also, smoking should be advised no. So, all these are the precautions or lifestyle changes and weight reduction which I have to do. A daily activity of 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity workout or 70 to 75 to 150 minutes per week of aerobic extensive vigorous workout is advice so after the lifestyle changes we all have that aim should be a bp control within the next three months now what are the challenges bp control remains poorly normally poorly controlled in more than half of the patients most patients require combination of drugs to control BP. Monotherapy is usually ineffective. The, tradition, the early approach of initial monotherapy and then a step care approach 
is not good. In addition, poor compliance with multiple pill treatment is also a major factor which is causing poor BP control. So nowadays we are advising single pill, SPC. Okay, so initial dual therapy combination treatment, it provides, it provides fast, efficient, well-tolerated, more consistent and more effective BP control. SPC, single pill combination therapy, provides better compliance with therapy as patient prefers to take one pill. SPCs combining the preferred drug treatment for all patients are now available, like both dual combination and triple combination are available, and this has led to simplified approach and reduce the pill burden and better control. Now, we all know the antihypertensive drugs which are available. The main five drug classes which are there are ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, diabetics, the thiazide and thiazide like diabetics, such as clot, thalidone, and endopamide. And all these are effective in reducing CV morbidity and mortality. Now, the recommendation is all hypertensive patients should be given among these classes either an ACE inhibitor, ARB, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, or diuretics. And they cause reduction in BP as well as reduction in cardiovascular events. The newer guidelines as well as the guidelines in 2018, they both say combination treatment, like from the start, combination treatment is recommended for most of the hypertensive patient as initial therapy. And the preferred combination should comprise of either an ACE on ARP with a CCB or diuretic and other combinations can be used. Beta blockers are combined with any of the other major drug classes when there are special indications like if a patient has angina, his post myocardial infarction, if a patient has heart failure or there is high heart rate, patient has tachycardia. So we will prefer a beta blocker. And some of the newer uh, indications to go for a beta blocker nowadays are like if a patient has thyrotoxicosis, if a patient has migraine, essential tremors, hypokinetic heart syndrome, or if a patient has uh, peripheral artery disease with claudication, and if a uh, patient is having atrial fibrillation, or if the patient is having portal hypertension, all these patients we can prefer and go for a beta blocker. It is recommended to initiate an antihypertensive treatment with a two drug combination, preferably in a single pill. Only patients where we start with a single drug, mono drug is frail older patients, and those who have grade one hypertension and that are at low risk. Low risk patients is those who don't have any HMOD, no CAD, no CDD, nothing is there. So it is recommended that if BP is not controlled with a two drug combination, we can go to three drug combination. And if the BP is not controlled with three drug, we label the patient as resistant hypertension. We'll just go. And combination of two RAS blockers like ACE and ARB is not recommended. So this is the flow chart. Suppose a patient has come to you. Preferable is start with a dual combination in a single pill, one pill, one pill. The combination can be either an ACE or ARB with a calcium channel blocker or a diuretic. If the patient is not controlled, step two is ACE or ARB with a calcium channel blocker plus a diuretic, like triple drug combination. And if the patient is still not controlled, we label him as resistant hypertension and we can add spinolactone or we can add alpha blocker or a beta blocker and refer the patient. Monotherapy is to be considered only if the patient is having low risk grade 1 hypertension or the patient is very old and frail. Beta blockers are already told to use when. Now, there are, these are the specific indications when to use what. Like if a patient is having coronary artery disease, already a patient is of coronary. Here, we will prefer beta blocker. So, in place of calcium channel blockers, we can, in the first line only, we can use beta blockers. Or in place of diabetic, we can use beta blocker, preferably in a patient of CRD. So, also a difference in initiating treatment is when the patient's the systolic BP is more than 130, in patients who have established CVD, like already patient had an MI, we can start treatment. So, to target systolic BP to less than 130, but in all these patients, the systolic should not be lowered below 120, and the target diastolic BP is to less than 80, but not below 70. And in older patients, 
above 65, the target is between 130 to 140. In hypertensive patients who had a history of myocardial infarctions, was he at MI also. Beta blockers and RAS blockers are already being prescribed as part of the treatment. And if the patient has symptomatic angina, we'll prefer giving a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. If a patient has now the hypertensive drugs, which we uh, favor when a patient has chronic kidney disease, ACE, ARB, or a calcium channel blocker. Now, in such patients, we have to take care when we are giving ACE or ARB, we have to monitor patient's potassium because ACE or ARB causes hyperkalemia. So, once we start patient on ACE or ARB, we have to ask him to come after two weeks with a repeat threat and then if there is rise in creatinine more than 30% or there is rise in potassium above 5.5, we have to stop the drug or give potassium binders. Otherwise, they are good for these patients. ACE, ARB plus calcium channel blockers. In all these patients, so a reduction in EGFR and rise in serum creatinine is expected in CKD to receive bp lowering ther therapy, especially in those treated with ACE or ARB. But if the Rise in creatinine is more than 30%, then we should evaluate that this patient is having possible renal vascular disease. So, a combination of grass blocker with a calcium channel blocker or a diabetic is recommended. Even in CKD, no and never combine two RAS blockers. If a patient has LVH or patient is a patient with heart failure, in these patients also, we prefer using a CCB and a beta blocker. Dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers can be added. But the recent advances or the recent guidelines, they suggest that in patients having heart failure, whether preserved or reduced, adding ARNI is suggested and adding an SGLT2 inhibitor. That is also advised that we can add ARNI. I hope you all must be uh, knowing about ARNI. So, if a patient has reduced heart failure, ACE or ARB, we, we give ACE ARB plus a diuretic, which can be a loop diuretic also, and a beta blocker. If the patient is not controlled, the next therapy is we can add a MRA, like spinal electron. So, in all heart failure, uh, reduced ejection friction patients, Give an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, give a diuretic plus a beta blocker and still if the BP is not controlled, add a, a mineral receptor antagonist like spinolactone and also preferably in place of ASA or ARB, we can give RNA, we have to add SGLT2. These are the latest guidelines which are being recommended. If a patient has stroke, then uh, in the stroke patients, normally they say if the patient is having uh, hemorrhagic stroke. In these patients, if the patient comes within first six hours, hemorrhagic patients, then lower the BP and the BP is around 220, lower the BP to 140, 90. But suppose the patient comes after six hours, then gradually lower the BP. And in a patient with infarct, thrombotic stroke, then gradually lower the BP to less than 180 by 105, if you are planning for a thrombolysis, there should be no rapid decrease in the BP in patients with stroke. And uh, as such, when the patient is in follow-up for secondary prevention, a RAS blocker plus a calcium channel blocker or a thiazide like diuretic is preferred. In patients who have atrial fibrillation, again, a beta blocker or non-dihydropinic uh, Hydropine calcium channel blocker like verapamil uh, and deltazem is preferred, but both of them should not be given. So, patient has atrial fibrillation, patient has hypertension, if ACE or ARB, you can, you can combine a beta blocker or deltazem or verapamil, but not both of them. And if still not controlled, then you can add a dihydropin calcium channel blocker. In patients with atrial fibrillation, we also have to give anticoagulation. And there we calculate the Chad West score. And till the BP is not below 160 and 100, don't start anticoagulation as it may increase the risk of hemorrhage. So, uh, next we come to patients who have lead, lead, lower extremity arterial disease like peripheral arterial disease. 
this is more common patients who have already have other evidence of atherosclerotic disease like who have already have CAD. Suppose a patient already has CAD. There are high chances he'll be having PAD also. So in these patients, a combination of RAS, a CCB or diabetic should be considered, but beta blockers can also be considered as they lower the cardiovascular risk in these patients. So till now we have only seen what are the indications. Now these are drugs where you should remember these are the contraindication. Diuretics should not be given. Thiazide or thiazolic drugs should not be given to a patient having gout. If there is metabolic syndrome, glucose intolerance, pregnancy, hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, avoid them. The newer ones, chlorothalidone has less of them. Beta blockers, don't give in a patient of asthma, bradycardia, uh, and any AV block. Avoid in patients having glucose intolerance or metabolic syndrome. Calcium channel antagonist, avoid in patients with tachyarrhythmia or heart failure. Pre-existing severe leg edema because side effect of calcium antagonist is peripheral edema. Calcium antagonist, non dihydrocurin if the patient is having bradycardia or high EP blocks or severe LV dysfunction, avoid where apomeltatism. ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in pregnancy, never given pregnancy. If there is history of previous angioneurotic edema, don't give it. Hyperkalemia, don't give it. Bilateral renal artery stenosis is an absolute contraindication. It should not be given normally. In women, if there is no reliable contraception, as it is contraindicated in pregnancy, same for ARVs also. Now, what is resistant hypertension or pseudo hypertension? Pseudo resistance. Pseudo resistance is the patient is not taking the medicine, so that's why the BP is high. Poor adherence, white coat phenomena, poor office BP measurement technique, clinical clinicians inertia, or there is marked brachial artery calcification. Now, resistant hypertension, we have many causes, older age, obesity, more common in black people, excess dietary sodium intake. And moreover, if there is a patient has evidence on it, if there's evidence of LDH, CKD, there is uh, isolated systolic hypertension. All these indicate that this is resistant hypertension. And some drugs may order contraceptives, and says cyclosporin, all these all these drugs can also cause secondary hypertension. So what to do? If a patient has secondary resistant hypertension or the patient has recurrent hypertension, we have to add first reinforcement of lifestyle measures, sodium restriction. We can add low dose of spironolactone. And if this patient can still not, is still not uh, responding to, we can either add beta blocker, bisoprolol, or alpha uh, antagonist we can add. So all this, but if a patient is having resistant to hypertension and all these factors have been taken care of, then you can refer the patient for specialist treatment. Secondary hypertension is suspected in younger patients who are having grade two or three hypertension, sudden worsening of hypertension, severe grade three hypertension, if there is extensive HMOD, if patients have obstructive sleep apnea, there's features suggest of all these pheochromocytoma, all these indicate that patient has secondary hypertension. These are the common causes of secondary hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, renal parenchymal disease, atherosclerotic, endocrine causes, pheochromocytoma, Cushing's, thyroid, hyperparathyroidism, coagulation of aorta, all of the drugs which yeah, you have to take the history of drugs, all these are causes of secondary hypertension. And as per age group also, the causes are which are more predominant, like in middle age, primary aldosterone is the most common cause. Obstructive sleep apnea. In young females, the uh, fibromuscular dysplasia is most common cause of secondary hypertension. And in elderly, older adults, it is the atherosclerotic renovascular disease, which is the more, most common cause of secondary hypertension. Now, just to tell you, hypertensive, what is hypertensive emergency? If the PP is more than 225, 120 and the, uh, there is evidence of target organ damage. And if there is no evidence of target uh, damage, we call it hypertensive urgency. If there is evidence of target organ damage, we call it as emergency. And in these conditions, we have to give first line treatment as lebetalol, nicardipin. In hyper hypertension and encephalopathy, immediately reduce the BP and we have to give lebetalol, nicardipin. In acute coronary event, we give nitroglycerin. So these are the management which, which is in the hospital setup. 
Now, if a patient uh, has white coat hypertension, like patient came to you, he only has uh, BP when he was in the clinic. Otherwise, at home, it's okay. So, what do you ask him? You ask him lifestyle changes, ask him to get H uh, the home uh, BP monitoring, and then you ask patient to come for follow-up after four weeks. And the drug treatment may be considered in patients who have cardiovascular disease or who have HMO. Routine drug treatment is not indicated. And same is for mass hypertension. So in the, all these patients, monitoring and lifestyle changes are first advice. In pregnancy, we all together have the drugs uh, like ACE, ARDs are absolutely contraindicated. The first line drugs are methyl dopa, levetalol, and calcium channel blockers like long-acting nifedipine. And in them also, we, we have classified hypertension pregnancy into gestational pre-existing hypertension. And if we go through it, it will be long. But in women with gestational hypertension or mild preeclampsia, delivery is recommended by 37 weeks. So uh, any of these three treatments, like IV levetalol, oral methylopa, or nifedipine, is recommended to manage these patients. In diabetic patients, it's the guidelines are same. We have to target BP around 130, but not below 120. Similarly, target diastolic BP to 80, but not below one six, uh, below 70. And start with a RAS blocker or a calcium channel blocker or a thyroid or thyroid like diabetes. And uh, regarding when to use or whether to use statins or not, in these patients who have hypertension, the aim is to reduce uh, the LDL2 less than 50% of the baseline or below 70. If the patient has very high risk, the target LDL is 70. If the uh, severe risk is high, very high is less than 70. Uh, severe risk is just high than 100. And low to moderate risk is around 150. And there is no role of primary, uh, uh, no role of giving aspirin as primary prevention. Aspirin can be given to or it has to be given to all patients as secondary prevention, all those who had an earlier episode of CVD or stroke. And the follow-up, first you start the antihypertensive and you have to review the patient at least once within the next two months to evaluate how good the BP control is and any side effects. And single pill therapy should reduce normally within two weeks. The PP should come in one to two weeks. And in the next uh, two months, it will continue to reduce. And next further visits, you can plan at three to six months uh, interval. And it is as, uh, advisable to assess the risk, the risk factors and to evaluate for any organ damage being done every two years. And in patients with high normal, like just uh, between 130 to 139 and 80 to 84, regular follow-up annually at least, and then annual checkup for any HMOD is advised. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. That was such an exhaustive session and very informative. Uh, it was a good revision and, uh, you know, it was really nice to have. Uh, though it was extensive, the people have managed to find two queries. So one is uh, one is regarding the choice of antihypertensive uh, in people with single functioning kidney. Uh, in a patient like uh, in patients with single functional kidney, you have to evaluate first the status of the patient's kidney function test, like you have to evaluate the urine albumin creatinine ratio, any evidence of kidney damage of the solitary kidney if it's there. So if it's uh, there is no evidence, uh, preferably we'll go for a calcium channel blocker and a diuretic because in a single kidney, we avoid giving ACE and ARDs. So solitary kidney and bilateral renal artery stenosis both are, uh, are in fact, bilateral renal artery stenosis is an absolute contraindication and solitary kidney is a relative contraindication for ACRD. So here we'll prefer calcium channel blockers and a thyroid diuretic. Okay, ma'am. Uh, there is another query regarding uh, electrolyte imbalances on patients who are already taking diuretics. So is there any recommendation to monitor them? Uh, if there is any, how routinely we have to monitor it? Like normally, if, if a patient has uh, severe hyponatremia, if a patient elderly, especially elderly patients, if they are on diuretics, thyroid diuretics, and patient has hyponatremia, if it's below 130, you have to stop it. 
But if it's between 130 to uh, 135 and patient is asymptomatic, it's just an incidental finding. You can call the patient after one week with a repeat uh, sodium monitoring. So if there is electrolyte disturbance like hyponatremia, hypokalemia, especially in elderly patients, there in hyponatremia, you have to uh, stop if it's persistent and if it's below 130 and uh, patient is symptomatic. Uh, one more query regarding uh, primary hypertension in pregnant uh, ladies. So if the hypertension was pre-existing at the time of pregnancy, what changes except the ACE inhibitor part, ARB part, what other changes do we need to make in the uh, medication of the patient? Like if it depends what drug the, already the patient was taking. If ACE or ARB, we have to stop it. That is definite. If the patient is on diuretics, that also is preferably not uh, advised. So we can shift the patient and it depends how much is the BP. We can shift the patient to calcium channel blockers like nephedipine, which is more safer, or we can give patient um, methyl dopa. So uh, for first trimester, if the normally what happens also in, in pregnancy, there is, initial, there is a fall in the BP. In the, so if the patient is... Uh, Managing the patient is just a mild hypertensive, and in the initial first trimester, uh, the BP is on the lower side. The monitorings are all on the lower side. So we can try. It has been in the latest ESH guideline that you can stop for uh, one or two weeks and just keep a regular BP monitoring. If the patient is managing without the uh, antihypertensive drug and the BP is normal, you can continue uh, without the drug till in the second or third trimester it starts elevating again. So it has been advised that even uh, the patient who was already taking a drug and the BP is now on the lower side of the normal, you can stop the drug and monitor the patient regularly in pregnancy at times the first trimester and mid of till the mid of uh, second trimester, the, these patients don't have any problem. And if you want to give, I'll prefer calcium channel blockers or methyl dopa or labetalol okay, if the patient yeah. Okay, uh, there is one more query regarding the importance of ambulatory B, uh, BP monitoring, though I think we have discussed it earlier. Uh, if you yeah. could just give a very brief. Yeah, ambulatory BP monitoring, basically it is in patients who are in some patients, we have normally, normally in any person, there is a nocturnal dipping, like our normal BP dips at night. But there are patients who don't have this dipping. They have either reverse dipping, which is, in fact, their BP rises during sleep. And these patients are more prone for stroke and cardiovascular episodes. Like they may have heart attack at night or stroke during sleep. To detect these patients, ABPM is needed. And in these patients, the drug timing, like giving single pill at bedtime, is advised mainly for these patients. And this is more common in diabetics and CKD patients. So these patients, where we are suspecting that nighttime BP rises, ABPM can detect because the normal BP we can't apply at uh, while we are sleeping. So ABPM is indicated in these patients. Okay, ma'am. One last query. Uh, uh, person has asked how to choose between hydrochlorothiazide and chlorothalidone. Like uh, hydrochlorothiazide and chlorothalidone. In fact, uh, the long uh, drug which we are using for many years is hydrochlorothiazide, but chlorothalidone and indapamide both have lesser of the side effects like the effect on the metabolic profile, glucose intolerance, and lesser and lesser effect on the uric acid. So preferable now is better side effect profile. Uh, I think that's it for the queries. And uh, it was a really nice session. And I think we can close the session. So I thank you for such an informative session and the participants. So I think we'll meet all of you in a topic, another another topic next month. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.